Egyptians. So we <laughs> it's been a, it's been a, a little bit of a long time. Like it's been one month. I've been a bit a bit busy with my stuff as architect and then a few a few other things. So yeah, but it's time. Finally, it's finally time for for the for the big enigma that came out after the last video, which is the labyrinth of Hawara. What is the labyrinth of Hawara? Just before we start the, the actual video, the content. Uh, imagine if there if there was a building that is way bigger than the pyramids and way more intriguing in terms of like specially like you have like imagine that you have a building with three thousand chambers and two floors and underground spaces and uh, and imagine that that building would have date way before the pyramids and imagine if in that building on the walls there would be uh, inscribed magical tricks and whatever spells uh, anything imagine if that was true because for a long time the labyrinth of Hawara was a myth uh, been been told been told by these historians uh, of the past of the classic times and then being portrayed in the Renaissance and being then since then um, object of excavations and expeditions very dangerous expeditions uh, imagine if that building exists and imagine if that building is still underground and imagine if that building needs still to be excavated entirely and imagine if the last time any human being have been down there was just about when they completed that building and then what if we what have we lost in these thousands of years well in 2008 an expedition founded by Louis de Cordier a Belgian artist claimed and to, to, to have actually found the labyrinth of Hawara uh, and this is the story I'm gonna tell you today Cheers. And so here we are. How I don't even know how to begin this. So I divided this video in kind of two parts where we can get the historical accounts and then the we go through in more details on the Mataha expeditions of the 2008. Uh, so the last video was about Herodotus and you can watch that to see the accounts of Herodotus on the labyrinth of Hawara which I quoted Herodotus for the for the whole for the whole accounts uh, that uh, he he made on the labyrinth and uh, so you can you can actually like check it out in the last two minutes of the video there is the whole Herodotus on the labyrinth of Hawara uh, so we're gonna we're not gonna repeat this here we are gonna start with uh, the next person that found the labyrinth after Herodotus which was Diodorus Siculus if I'm not wrong I got some notes here because it's a long it's gonna be uh, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting this to be a long video uh, but we'll see we'll see later um, well actually uh, let's let's just begin with a little bit of context so labyrinth of Awara is um, basically the most important unrevealed temple of ancient Egypt and uh, was always considered to be a myth um, is located uh, supposedly <laughs> but, no, it is located in the Fayum area but it's not in the Fayum like oasis is in between the Fayum oasis and the Nile so it's in this in that uh, part of the territory which is linked which basically the Nile there forms a little canal that goes into the Fayum and forms the lake 
uh, and so the Hawara is located just at the entrance of that uh, of that uh, part. <laughs> Uh, and what what there is in Hawara is uh, first of all Hawara means the great temple in ancient Egyptian. This is what I found, <laughs> and uh, what we've got there is a pyramid. Is the pyramid of Amenhat, Amenemhat the third, which is the sixth king of the twelfth dynasty, so Middle Kingdom. Is what I'm not sure if it's the last big pyramid that have been built in ancient Egypt or one of the la or one of the latest. But it's probably, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about that, but it for sure is one of the latest. Uh, and so it's, it was built uh, with mud brick, but the core of it is in limestone. And, uh, and so inside of the pyramid, you, you, it's still intact, okay? So the, the problem there of the area is that the water is rising due to the fact that, uh, the thing is that since, since the Egyptian government made the Aswan Dam, of the on on the in Aswan, the Nile doesn't doesn't have the si the natural cycles as it used to have, and so nowadays the water level is rising uh, in the in that part of the in that part of the region. Now I'm not an expert in floodings and uh, water systems, but uh, the problem is that uh, there is a there is a flooding problem and. What is the problem? The actual problem there is that uh, the water somehow is salty and uh, is is getting is already inside of the of the pyramid in in the chambers, which is if you if you have a look on the plan of that pyramid is really complex. Um, and what happens is that the salt is get is, is eroding the the whole the whole inside. And so this is actually one of the reasons why the Mataha expedition exists uh, at all, or why we need, wh or why we, or why the labyrinth of Awara topic matters, uh, because we don't have much time to save this monument, which has been there for thousands of years under the sands and uh, in peace, <laughs> and now we do the the dam of Aswan and well, no, I'm recording a video, I'm recording the video. No, and <laughs> um, oh, I'm recording. What the fuck? <laughs> Jesus. So, was my neighbor, and uh, what happens is where were we? Ah, okay. So that that's the labyrinth. That's the pyramid. That is um, just what is. So so the thing is that the pyramid sits on top and on the north part of the labyrinth the so-called labyrinth. So the thing is that the labyrinth is so big and so deep down the the level of the of the of the ground that there is a pyramid and it's believed that the pyramid it was also uh, um, because the pyramid is, is believed to be um, um, er earlier than the than the labyrinth. So the labyrinth is supposed to be like super old like uh, we've got uh, we, I'm gonna t tell you later and uh, and so and the orientation of the pyramid is different than the than the than the, than the labyrinth itself. So yeah, so these are two different uh, period constructions uh, in principle. So uh, this is just an introduction, and I think we can go through the um, through the uh, historical accounts. Beginning with I got I got here some notes. Beginning first with. Mm, uh, a guy called Maneto Egyptica, uh, which uh, was probably not a name of a guy, uh, which says, um, is ah no yeah so basically this is a list of kings. Uh, it's not a guy. <laughs> this is a is a list of kings and uh, the fourth king Lamares, eight years. He built the labyrinth in the Arsinoid Nome as a tomb for himself. So. Yeah, this is a fragment uh, of dated from the third century BC, and uh, it's found in the Manito Egyptiaca. Okay. Uh, nothing. It's just saying that it was a it was a tomb. Uh, then we've got Diodorus Siculus. Uh, I suppose this was a Roman Diodorus, or maybe late Greek. I'm not sure. And quote. Although he was responsible for no military achievements whatsoever, he did build himself what is so called the labyrinth as a tomb. Again, 
the tomb topic comes 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 back. An edifice which is wonderful, not so much for its size as for the inimitable skill with which it was built. For one thing. It is impossible to find one's way out again, without difficulty, unless one lights upon a guide who is perfectly acquainted with it. Be that as it may, the Cretan labyrinth has completely disappeared, either through the destruction wrought by some ruler or through the ravages of time, but the Egyptian labyrinth remains absolutely perfect in its entire construction, down to my time. And seized with enthusiasm for this enterprise, they strove eagerly to surpass all their predecessors in the size of their building. For they chose a site beside the channel, so he says there, is, there was already a channel there, leading into Lake Moeris in Libya. And there, constructed, they, and there constructed their tomb of the finest stone, laying down an oblong as the shape and the state as the size of each side, while in respect of carving and other works of craftsmanship, they left no room for their successors to surpass them. <laughs> Which is amazing. For when one had entered the sacred enclosure, one found a temple. Again, uh, he says there was a tomb and then now he says uh, there was a temple inside, surrounded by columns, 40 to each side. And this building had a roof made of a single stone. Carved with panels and richly adorned with excellent paintings, it contained memorials of the homeland of each of the kings. So it was not just the tomb of one guy, it was a tomb of many kings, as well as of the temples and sacrifice carried out in it, all skillfully worked in paintings of the greatest beauty. Generally, it is said that the king conceived their tomb on such an expensive and prodigious scale that if they had not been deposed before its completion, they would not have been able to give their successor any opportunity to surpass them in architectural feasts. Fits. Fits. So, important uh, report from Diodorus Siglus. Now, this guy is from the third, is from the first century BC. So, 400 years after Herodotus. <laughs> Still speak like, like reports that uh, have such such an extent of. Yeah, such an interval of time between them interesting uh, next after this guy we've got uh -huh, Strabo and uh, Strabo is the first century after Jesus <laughs> gonna, uh, so actually it's in between so it's between the first century BC and the, and the first century uh, CE does he say like CE anyway uh, mm, Jesus time quote in addition to these things there is the edifice of the labyrinth which he is a building quite equal to the pyramids of and nearby the tomb of the king who built the labyrinth well he uh, says that uh, the labyrinth and the person that built the pyramid is the same there is at the point where one first enters the channel about 30 or 40 states along the flow a flat trapezium shaped site which contains both a village and the great palace, made up of many palaces, equal in number to that of the gnomes in the former times. For, for such is the number of peristyle courts which lie contiguous with one another, all in one row and backing on one wall, as though one had a long wall with the courts lying before it. And the passages into the courts lie opposite the wall. Before the entrances there lie what might be called hidden chambers which are long and many in number, and have paths running through one another which twists and run, so that no one can enter or leave any court without a guide. And the wonder of it is the roofs of each chamber are made of single stones, and the width of the hidden chambers is spanned in the same way by monolithic beams of outstanding size, for nowhere is wood or any other material included. And if one mounts onto the roof, at no great height because of the building has only one story it is possible to get a view of a plane of masonry made of such stones and if one drops back down from there into the court it is it is possible to see them lying there in row each supported by 27 monolithic pillars the walls too are made up in stones of no less a size it's important here because uh, strabo says that there is a village 
and the building is just one, one story and so what this means is that by that time the basically the, the upper floor was destroyed and used as a source of material stones uh, and somebody built like uh, like locals built a village on top of the on top of it on top of the the roof of the underground floor and uh, this is very important because uh, this says that uh, there is still half of the labyrinth there um, yeah so this is important and still, again and again uh, the roof is made of a single stone the, this topic is still being coming is still coming back then we got Pliny the... Uh, this was the longest quote, I, I, if I'm not wrong, so don't be scared. Uh, Pliny the Elder, 1st century CE. There still exists even now in Egypt, in the Heraclopolis Nome, the one which was built first, according to the tradition, 3600 years ago. By King Petesukis or Titosis. To Herodotus ascribed the whole work to 12 kings and some medicus, the latest of them. So this is super cool. Uh, Pliny the Elder uh, was not that old because uh, there was somebody older, 3,600 years before him, building the labyrinth from, from what he says. Um, oh, actually the quote continues. <laughs> Um, it would be impossible to describe in detail the layout of the building and its individual parts since it is divided into regions and administrative districts which are called gnomes, each of the 21 gnomes giving its name to one of the houses. Um, a third reason is the fact that it also contains temples of all the gods of Egypt. Nemesis placed in the buildings 40 chapels, many pyramids of 40 cells, each covering an area of 6 rod with their base. Men are already weary with traveling when they reach that bewildering maze of paths. There are also lofty upper rooms, reached by ramps and porticos, from which one descends on stairways which have 90 steps each. Inside are columns of imperial porphyry, images of gods, statues of kings and representations of monsters. Certain of the holes are arranged in such a way that as one throws open the door there arises within a fearful noise of thunder. Moreover, <laughs> moreover one passes through most of them in darkness. There are again other massive buildings outside the wall of the labyrinth. They call them the wing. Then there are other subterranean chambers made by excavating galleries in the soil. This is also super crazy because it's not just the underground chambers. He is saying that underneath the labyrinth itself, carved it into the bedrock, there are other galleries. Crazy. Crazy. Then we got Pom Ponius Mela, <laughs> 4th century CE. The building of Psammetic, the labyrinth, includes within the circuit of one unbroken wall a thousand houses and twelve palaces, and is built of marble as well as being roofed with the same material. It has no descending way into it. Uh, it has one descending way into it and contains within almost innumerable paths which have many convulsions twisting hider and feather. So this is the reports from the classic times, okay, so it's from like Herodotus to the first century CE. And what happens next? Uh, well, now we are in 2000 CE and uh, what happens in these 2000 years? So in these 2000 years, um, uh, Egyptomania <laughs> began to be a thing <laughs> and, um, and so basically the, um, there were some, um, some uh, in the, for example in the Renaissance uh, there was a rediscover of ancient Egypt uh, the first time that uh, Europe got interested again on ancient Egypt was in the Renaissance and uh, for example there are a lot of um, not a lot actually, there are a few um, representations of the labyrinth from some, ant from some artists. For example, we've got uh, uh, Anastasis Kircher, uh, that was the first pictorial reconstruction. Okay. Then we've got uh, Paul Lukas, which made a painting of the ruins of the village 
and was told by local that some years before he went into its subterranean chambers and it looked like uh, a lot of shops. Uh, um, then we got Richard Pocock, uh, which confirms the account of Herodotus. Thank you, Richard. Um, then we got an Italian, uh, Luigi Canina, which was actually an Italian architect. Good something in common here. Um, was professor of architecture in Turin uh, and was very passionate on ancient Egypt, like somebody. Um, and made a wonderful um, like plan of a labyrinth, which is speculative. Uh, it's not real, but uh, is wonderful. Then they. So this is like the Renaissance period. Uh, it's basically portraying what, what, so what the classic people were saying and writing. These guys were doing by painting and uh, and drawing, which is really good. Because again, I keep saying the same thing. Architects are writers. We just don't. We just write without words. We write with lines. And uh, anyway, <laughs> so we got then what we got. We got expeditions. So the first time the European just actually go to Egypt and try to figure out the, all the enigmas of, of this country. Uh, and, and I think like obviously the, the most important expedition that was done was, uh, was with Napoleon um, with, uh, and the subsequent description, description of the Egypt, <laughs> something like that. Uh, and so Napoleon comes in Egypt in like 1799, so around like, you know, 18,000, 18,000, 1800. <laughs> um, and um, so, so we've got here uh, a guy called Jomard Caristi uh, claimed that he found the ruins of the labyrinth uh, and is in the description de l'Egypte. Um, then we've got Belzoni. Another Italian, actually it's not just another Italian, we're gonna make a video just on Belzoni, this guy is, the story of this guy is crazy. And he made just a little drawing and he claims that he examined the place, but he, does, he didn't say anything about the labyrinth. Uh, then we got Carlepsus, which uh, was the first to actually excavate uh, the, the site in 1843. He claimed to have found some chambers. Uh, but in fact, he found Roman ruins. Then we got Luigi Vassalli, the third Italian, <laughs> in uh, 1855, uh, or no, well, maybe that that was the the day, the, the year he was born, probably. <laughs> uh, he excavated, but um, nothing found related to the labyrinth. Thank you, thank you, Luigi. We'll say. Um, and then, <laughs> and then we've got finally the. Hey, this guy is so interesting, uh, Mr. Flinders Petrie, father of archaeology and Egyptology. Um, and he, what? So the, what, what happens here is like this guy goes there and he started to. Ex I'm gonna resume it. So he started to excavate, and uh, what? And, and he found a huge stone, like. A huge stone, and uh, he thought that that stone could have been the foundations of because it's so big and so contiguous that he was like, okay, this must be the foundations of the labyrinth because it was believed that the labyrinth was destroyed, and so he he found the stone and he's like, okay, this must be, but it's huge. Like he's claiming that like 300 meters long and 250 meters wide, like you know, it's like crazy big and uh, that you could fit Luxor and Karnak all together and a few other temples and it could fit in there like I'm not gonna quote because it's already 21 minutes I'm not gonna quote uh, I'm not gonna quote uh, Frindus Petri but you can find uh, um, you can find uh, the report from from Petri uh, and if you find yourself in London go to the Petri Museum because you're a lucky man or person uh, and then we've got the modern excavations, and so, for example, Al Bazidi in 1995, for example, he cleared the entrance to the pyramid. So basically, he's the first guy, first guy to maybe he's the first guy to enter. I'm not sure. Maybe it was Petri, probably it was Petri. But anyway, so uh, the, the site got cleared a little bit, and then now his last, 
probably um, the way is the most important thing that happened uh, on this side in 2008 Louis de Cordier uh, super ah guys check it out he's a super interesting artist uh, from Belgium he now lives in Spain and it's uh, it's been very he, he has been quite quite uh, quite uh, use, useful and interesting to talk to for for this for this research so I really thank him uh, it is super clean it's super clear the, the, the accounts uh, but anyway so the um, the Mataha expedition so in 2008 um, uh, Louis de Cordier assembled a team made from made of the Ghent University and the and the geophysics research of Hawara um, the National Research Institute of Astronomy and Geophysics uh, so he put together a, a few experts and uh, he started to gra he, he make he made a ground penetrating radar and not just ground penetrating radar he made different techniques he they used different techniques and uh, they cross examined the results of what they uh, of the what of, of you know of the results of the ground penetrating radar and something crazy something crazy was discovered so basically the stone the big stone that was found by Petrie, he claimed was the foundation. The Mataha expedition claimed that that's actually the roof of the underground chamber. And why is that? Because from the ground penetrating radar, it, it's possible to see the, the what is be, below a certain level. And uh, below even the level of the nearby channel, uh, so from 9 to, if I'm not wrong, from 9 to 20 meters, so in that range, or 9 to 12, I don't, don't remember. I'm, there, um, there is a presence of lots of stones uh, and, uh, and organized in such a way, and it's not just, uh, and it's not just, so, so, so the thing is that um, uh, when they found, when they found this, uh, they, when they found out that it actually is the labyrinth is still there, the underground chambers are still there, in 2008 they published the results, uh, they made a conference in, uh, in the Ghent University, they tried to reach out to people and say, hey guys, we found something huge, and, uh, and uh, one would say this could, be go, like, this could go international, like oh, well, it's the biggest discovery ever of Egypt, of ancient Egypt. No, so the research was shut down by the by by the secretary of the antiquities of that time, which was Dr. Zahiawas, <laughs> and um, and so what happens there is that he he basically said, okay, guys, don't don't talk about it, otherwise uh, you're gonna pay a lot of money, uh, and so they they made a website. Uh, from which they publish, it's sti still available the website. So if you search, I'm gonna put the link in the description. But you just search Labyrinth of Awara Cosmo Costco Foundation, and you you find you find there the, all the documents. But not everything is available because a few other things are not available because it has been you know uh, forbidden by the government of Egypt of the time. And so what happens now is that we have uh, this. Um, I don't, we don't even know what uh, what we have here. It's a chaos of uh, bureaucracy and power and uh, scientific research, and uh, we just need public interest in this uh, to save the monument because UNESCO was supposed to be there, and it was supposed no, it was actually interest on the site, and then they they withdraw, they withdraw, they just didn't go ahead with uh, with it, and so. Um, so what happens is in 2019, if I'm not wrong, the Costco Foundation or, or Louis, uh, they, they ask again, they applied again to uh, save the site, to the, at least they applied again to the Egyptian government to try to save the site, and there is still no answer. Uh, they haven't uh, replied yet. And so, I mean, I, I've got so much more information, but uh, I just, uh, this is already like 30 minutes <laughs> video, and uh, please, if you have questions, uh, ask, and, 
uh, try to research also yourself if you're interested on the topic because you can't find much in internet and uh, you actually have to reach out to people and uh, if you have some interest please like reach out to me if you have some questions I can't I mean there, are, there is a lot more uh, but uh, I think as a as a synthesis of the topic is already here uh, uh, now uh, please um, if you like the video uh, just do like some like thing because it helps the channel and um, consider su to subscribe because maybe if you like the, this content because we, the next time we're gonna probably go into religion and the relationship between Christianity and uh, and uh, ancient Egypt religion probably could be the next uh, next, next video or maybe we go to the <laughs> Osiris myth probably uh, I don't know but let's see and uh, we're gonna go through architecture uh, not very soon I'm st I still want to give a context of uh, of ancient Egypt and then we go through each building <laughs> very not that soon but in the summertime probably so consider to, to subscribe it doesn't cost you anything and it helps the channel uh, so thank you and thank you for the for the 40 subscribers and for the 100 views average that uh, the videos are doing so I'm quite uh, happy to do this because it's really helped me to study uh, ancient Egypt and go through it and it also helped me to like the storytelling skills <laughs> which is uh, something nice so thank you thank you again and uh, let's see you soon maybe with the, the myth of Osiris let's see cheers